Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Council Member Story. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Brooks. Here. And Member Tran. Here. Pledge of Allegiance. Kristen? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Any additions, any materials that are received late? Yes, we have um, two items for 7A, public comment items, and then for 7B, we have information from the Business Improvement Association Committee that has been working on a proposal for the lights. Thank you. Any deletions, additions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay, seeing none. Public comments, this is a time to give public comments for any item that is not on the agenda that you'd like to speak, to speak to. Seeing none, back to City Council for staff and City Council comments. Staff? No comments. Okay. No comments from city staff or city council. I, I will just very quickly note that tomorrow night the Planning Commission will hear the conceptual review for the mall redevelopment program and the following Thursday the 14th it will be presented to the city council. Public is uh, encouraged to attend, learn about the plans for the mall and provide any input before a formal application is presented. Thank you, Linda. Okay, uh, we're on to city council consent calendar. So is anyone on the city council or anyone in the public wanting to bring uh, for consideration an item on the consent calendar? Sam. I don't necessarily want to pull an item, but I did have a question if I may on item 6B. Okay. Proceed. Public oh. works. Steve. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, Steve, um, my particular question was, I, I noticed the intersections that they have adapted signaling is proposed for. And we're just wondering why 41st and Gross was not also included in that series. Um, so. so 41st and Gross is actually controlled by Caltrans. So it's one of their signals, and that's actually part of the grant that we'd gotten the in the previous one. year. Uh, yeah. Where it referred to the off ramps, right, right, uh, included 41st and Gross that. as well, yes, and it so does. those will be connected and all in, in a comprehensive system on 41st right. to Broma. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. So, is there a motion on the city's consent calendar? I'll move the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's move on. On to general government and public hearings. We have 7A, consider adopting an urgency and ordinance and temporary prohibiting no fault evictions. Is there a staff report? Yes, there is. Thank you. Good evening. There we go. Okay, so a as you likely know, in early October, October, Governor Newsom signed into law Assembly Bill 1482, which essentially, um, it's, it's called the uh, Tenant Protection Act. It, it governs rent gouging and eviction control. And there are two primary components of the bill. There's other inclusions relating to notice, but for our purposes, the two primary components are eviction control and rent control. And the rent control provision says that there can be no limits all annual rent increases for covered units to 5% per year plus the CPI or 10%, whichever is lower. And the eviction control provisions limit evictions of covered units to those that have just cause, which is defined in the statute. And essentially the just cause provisions in the statute are um, things like violating the lease, uh, using the unit for any legal purposes, using the unit to cause a nuisance. And then there's another section of uh, evictions which are allowed for things like the owner wishing to move into the unit, um, the owner wishing to remove the unit from the market, it's called an Ellis Act eviction. But it's a pretty limited uh, number of reasons for which an owner can evict the tenant. 
thank you. <laughs> uh, the statute is applicable to units in which all of the tenants have lived there for 12 months or in which one of the tenant has lived there for 24 months. I imagine this provision was created to capture tenancies in cities that are very crowded like San Francisco or uh, tenancies that have large families where there are multiple tenants who live in a unit. And it also does not, there are several carve outs from the statute. It does not apply to single family homes, affordable housing units, or condos, unless the condos are governed by, a, are owned by a corporation or a real estate trust. Um, there are lots of other carve outs, but those are the ones that I think will probably be most impactful. The current law, but the AB 1482 becomes effective January 1st, 2020. Currently, there is no just cause or um, statewide rent, no just cause eviction or statewide rent control. Various cities, multiple cities, have rent control provisions themselves already in place, but there are no statewide requirements for just cause to evict a tenant, and there are no statewide limitations on rent increases. Also, currently under state law, there are, however, um, requirements for notice for evicting tenants, and the requirements are 30 days if the tenants have lived in the unit for a year, for less than a year, and 60 days if the tenants have lived in the unit for more than a year. At the last meeting, council requested that staff bring back an urgency ordinance that would essentially bridge the gap between the governor's signature of AB 1482 and the effective date of AB 1482, which is January 1, 2020. Multiple other jurisdictions in the state have passed such ordinances. Those ordinances look pretty much what, like what we're bringing to you tonight. Um, various jurisdictions have tweaked them, but not much. They pretty much look the same. And those ordinances essentially um, prohibit evictions between now, whenever the urgency ordinance is passed, and January 1, 2020. And then they, um, in various ways, go away after January 1, 2020, whatever the mechanism is. Um, the eviction, one thing to note too is evictions become effective on the date on which the tenant requires, is required to relinquish possession of the unit. So regardless of whether a tenant has already received an eviction notice, that eviction is not effective unless the tenant has actually vacated. So if a tenant has received an eviction notice and the council adopts this ordinance this evening, since it's an urgency ordinance, it will be effective immediately. And so those tenants would be captured by the protections in the urgency ordinance, even if they've already received a notice. Was there anything else on that slide? No, okay. Oh, the very last thing, uh, th since this is an urgency ordinance, it requires a, f a super majority of the council, which is a four-fifths vote. Since there are only four of you, that will be all four of you. Okay. There are a couple changes that we're suggesting to you before, uh, um, of the ordinance that's before you. One is an expiration date. You'll see that already in the ordinance, we say that the um, eviction controls would uh, be in effect until December, 31st, 2019. That's the day before AB 1482 becomes effective. We suggest an expiration date of the ordinance a few months out to give the city time to complete any enforcement actions that might be in effect at the time the AB 1482 becomes effective. It's really a sort of um, belt and suspenders approach. If we are in the midst of an enforcement action, on June 15th, 2020, we can certainly come back to the council and suggest that the ordinance be extended. The other change that we're suggesting is, is a little more, it seems a little more complicated, but it's actually not. I, in drafting the urgency ordinance, I made an attempt to clarify some unclear language in the statute. And I, I think that in doing that, I actually made the language even more unclear. And so I'm suggesting to the council that you simply uh, use the language in the statute, which is not incredibly clear, I will admit. However, um, rather than come up with our own unclear language, we might as well just use the unclear language that the state is using because then the state will interpret it and every jurisdiction will be um, subject to the same interpretation. And so the language is in, it's in the ordinance, the urgency ordinance itself 
on, if you have your packet, it's on packet page 33, and it's in section C8, and it's talking about units that are excluded from the provisions of 1482, and I think the goal of this language from the state legislation was to say that condos are excluded because all single family homes are excluded from 1482. And so um, I think it was trying to say that condos are excluded and it used this somewhat confusing language about an, any unit that is alienable separate from the title. I, I don't know that most people know what that means, alienable separate. Um, it means an individual unit. And so I tried to clarify by noting um, by calling out some units that might be considered alienable, separate, mobile homes, condos, single family homes, and I think I just uh, made it more confusing. So our suggestion is that we simply substitute the language in section C8 with the language from the state legislation. Okay. Any questions? Would this have to be um, as an amendment then to to the action item today? Yes, and that. so what I would recommend the council do is when you're, if you would like to make a motion to adopt, when you do that, um, just give me a signal or I can even jump in and I will read the changes into the record for you so that you can adopt, if you, if you would like to adopt these changes, you can adopt with the changes as read into the record. I have a question. Kristen. Um, should the council pass this, how do the citizens use this to their benefit? Do they just bring the ordinance to their property owner, to their landlord, and say, this is the rule now, I'm not, no longer being evicted, or how, how would they move forward with, with action on, on their part to ensure that they receive benefit from this? Well, they certainly could. Um, it, probably the best approach, frankly, for tenants, perhaps if they've already received an eviction notice, would likely be to work with an attorney um, they could probably even retain an attorney through legal aid, work with an attorney and have their attorney write a letter to the landlord citing this ordinance and noting that the ordinance is effective, uh, it, it is effective now and so that it would essentially moot any eviction notice. They could also write that letter on their own. It's probably not a terribly difficult letter to write. Um, if the landlord refused, the city could take action using its code enforcement powers okay, to enforce the ordinance. So um, a follow-up question, um, wouldn't a letter from the city just stating this as a fact? We, we certainly could. I mean, it's pretty direct. Now they know they'd have to do the code enforcement thing. Sure. We certainly could do that as well. Okay. Yeah, and thank you. I just wanted to clarify that just cause eviction does not include a landlord wishing to uh, remodel um, uh, a premises. Um, and for the purposes of selling those premises? Sort of. So there, there's a carve out in the state legislation as well as in the or urgency ordinance allowing a landlord to evict for, I don't know what the, what is the verb, is substantial rehabilitation? Substantial repairs. Substantial repairs to bring the property into compliance with governing codes. So a landlord with, with, with health and safety codes. So if a landlord needed to do major updates to come into compliance with the code, the landlord could evict, but the landlord could not, you are correct, evict tenants because the landlord wanted to remodel the property, sell it for an increased rate empty, mm -hmm. and then rent to tenants at a higher rent. Right, thank you. That would be unlawful. More questions? Yeah. yeah, okay. Can you speak to the difference, um, how this is different than the rent control issue that's been brought up and what, how this is different? Sure, sure. So, it, like I said, 1482 has two primary provisions. One is rent control, that the state actually calls it anti rent gouging, um, it, and one is eviction controls. It, the jurisdictions that we've been monitoring that are passing urgency ordinances to bridge these gaps are only addressing the eviction control issue. They're prohibiting evictions between now and the effective date of the ordinance. Jurisdictions don't seem to be touching the rent control issue, and there's a variety of reasons. I, I think that um, 
the one that I think is most compelling to the city attorneys is that there's a question about notice for the rent control provisions, about whether or not the landlord has had effective notice if the landlord it's difficult for us to stop rent increases that were already noticed. We could, if the council wished, we, we, could, we could do that, and um, if the council wished to do that, and um, we might have some concerns legally with that approach, or if the council wished to include rent control provisions, the council could do it prospectively. So the council could say any rent control, any rent increases between now, uh, between now, the date of the urgency ordinance, and January 1, 2020, cannot exceed whatever is in the statute, 5% plus CPI. Like I said, other jurisdictions are not, do not seem to be doing that. And I think the reason is that the statute includes a retroactive provision for rent increases. Um, the statute requires, as of January 1, 2020, all rents be, um, Roll back to the what whatever the rent was as of March fifteenth, twenty nineteen. So I think cities figure that 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 is sufficient to cover any rent increases. Thank you. So I take it the there's no clock ticking in terms of eviction. We pass this, even though some people did get an eviction notice. That's it, null and void. If, they're, if they are still in possession of the unit. Oh, they still have to be there? Okay. They still have to be in possession of the unit. If they have already evicted, this likely, if they have already moved, this likely would not capture them. And if they are still within the notice period on the eviction notice, so if they got the eviction, if they've been in the unit for two years or more and are subject to a 60-day 60 60 notice days. provision, okay. if this, if November 6th is within, if they got the notice within 60 days, they are covered by this, by this ordinance. Okay, I've always had a question about um, the provision of moving in family members. What kind of um, restrictions are put on that? I mean, family member moves in and moves out a month later. I mean, yeah. how's that dealt with? Yeah, so the or the statute addresses that, and uh, and the ordinance that we're suggesting mirrors the statute. And I, I think it's that the family member it has to be the owner or family member member, and they have to live there for a year. Right, parent, uh, landlord, landlord's parents or children, they have to move in within three months and they have to occupy the unit as their primary residence. So they can't live somewhere else and just keep it vacant for at least a year. Do they have to like change their registration voter-wise or DMV or, I mean, do they have to actually exercise something that indicates that it's actually a primary residence? We don't delve that deeply here in the ordinance. Um, I could check your code to see if there's a definition of primary residence and that would apply. This would really be an enforcement issue by the city. So the city would need, if, if a landlord evicted someone, and it would probably be relatively easy to monitor because there are probably only so many evictions that could occur between now and December 31st, the city would need to follow up and we would probably rely on some assistance from the tenants who got evicted. Okay, so we need notice from them. We're not gonna monitor on our own. They'd have to tell us and then we would follow up. We could do whichever works. We, we could do whatever the city has capacity and interest to do. So we okay. could certainly monitor on our own. I know in San Francisco, uh, nonprofits help the city. The city does some monitoring. San Francisco has its own rent control ordinance that I think requires that for owner move in evictions, the owners live there for three years. In San Francisco, the city will on, will mo do some monitoring. They obviously don't have capacity to do much, and so some local nonprofits will do monitoring as well. Okay. Jimmy, do we have any um, capacity to do this? Uh, do we have any groups that we work with on this particular issue? Or has it not come up before, and so we really haven't been there? I think. Yeah, I think the latter is the answer to the question. The city certainly hasn't monitored occupancies of units in the past, but um, <clears throat> you know, if there was a situation where we had an eviction and someone was asserting that they were moving in pursuant to this residency, I think we would, I think as the city attorney suggested, primarily try to work with the tenant uh, and potentially try to work with some nonprofit partners to make sure that the monitoring um, took place and that someone was compliant with the provisions of our ordinance. Okay, with our city's attorney's help, I'm sure we could do it. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, are there any questions from those who are here for this item? Please come forward. These are questions. 
comments, please? Yes, my name is Rachel Ellis, and I have a comment on the um, interim emergency ordinance. And I want to advocate uh, for Capitola City to move forward on getting this ordinance. Um, due to the fact that Watsonville is experiencing the same thing through CNC property management, and we've already been in collaboration with CLRA, which will answer your question, um, Mrs. P Peterson, that um, if we move forward on this, they will take action on helping the um, no fault eviction residents that have already been working with them. And um, they will remove the eviction notices because they found just cause that these eviction notices do not stand in the court of law that CNC had already issued um, Capitola residents and um, city of Watsonville residents. Mm -hmm. um, we are also moving forward to try to push this for um, city of Watsonville as well next week. It's on an agenda item. Um, city council in Santa Cruz had already pushed this interim emergency ordinance. And I really would like to vouch for these residents um, because it's prevention of homelessness and displacement. Um, and it's devastating to them. At this moment, they're trying to find placement for their families around Christmas time, Thanksgiving time, and we have gotten no, no repercussion from CNC property management, no call back. And um, at this time, it's been a community effort to try to pull together all the resources we can to keep them in interim housing. Um, however, there's been a couple of folks that have been spooked already that had already vacated their unit um, due to unknowing what will happen and if they will get an eviction, if they're not putting in their 30-day uh, notice and how it will follow them. Um, we want to support our community members in um, feeling safe, feeling secure. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Gretchen Regenhardt. I'm with California Rural Legal Assistance. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say hello um, and let you know that we stand ready to help anybody who needs help enforcing their rights um, under the law. How can someone get a hold of California Legal Assistance? Well, we are located oh, in me. we're located in Watsonville. We also have a satellite office in Santa Cruz. People can call us at 831-724-2253, um, and we'll figure out how to help. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming. Any other comments from people that have come here to this meeting? Okay, bring it back to city council for comments and a motion. Mr. Mayor? Yes. If I may respond to one of the comments Please. from one of the speakers. The, this ordinance uh, captures all tenants who live in covered proper, covered units that for which they still legally retain the right to uh. live there. So if, for instance, a tenant has gotten a 60-day eviction notice and the notice expires November 30th, and the tenant got spooked and moved out October 10th, but the notice, the eviction notice still has not expired, if, the, it, and I don't, it's possible that the tenant has some arrangement with the landlord to move out early, who knows, but if not, and the unit is simply sitting vacant, and the tenant still has a legal right to that unit, the eviction notice has not expired, this ordinance would cover that tenant. So if a tenant has moved out and is concerned about whether or not this ordinance would cover the tenant, I would encourage the tenant to um, speak with someone to help them, perhaps the woman from Legal Aid who just spoke. How about in a situation where they got their refund on last month's rent and... In that case, they have probably surrendered their tenancy. Okay, got it. Thanks for that comment. So I have a comment if there's no comments from city council members before we get a motion. So one thing that's important to me, and it's the reason why I'm up here, and I'm pretty sure that's why a lot of us are up here, including those who work for the city, is section eight, which details the urgency clause. And this is one thing um, we're gonna vote on. So I'll just read it. The city council finds and declares that this ordinance is required for immediate protection of the public peace, health, 
and safety. That's everyone that lives in this city. Without it, city Capitola residents would suffer potentially irreversible displacement of tenants resulting from no fault evictions prior to the effective date of AB 1482. So this is one reason why we have city government and this is one reason why you choose carefully who you elect. Our job is to make sure the city is a good place for its residents and we want the security of the city for all the people that live here. And that's why we're considering this. So is there a motion? I'd like to move approval with the uh, changes recommended by our city attorney. Yeah. And now it's second. Great. If it's okay with the council, I'll read those changes into the record. Please. So the changes to the ordinance, there are two of them. One is on page 29 of the packet. Section two will now read effective date period. This ordinance shall take effect and be enforced immediately. The ordinance shall expire June 15th, 2020. Mm -hmm. The second change is on page 33 of the packet, yeah. section C8 of the ordinance. And the revised language is on the screen. <laughs> would the clerk <laughs> like me to read it, or would you? We're fine. We're okay, fine. great. So Thank you. So, clerk, you have these changes. I have the changes. Okay, well, that's the important thing. If she Very hasn't good. done it, that's it. Would you please do a roll call vote? <laughs> Council Member Story. Mayor, if I may, before we oh, take the vote, may I? One, I just want to thank the tenants who came out to our meeting mm -hmm. uh, and alerted us to this situation so that we could be in a position to do something about it. And I'm really um, pleased um, that I'm on the city council to be able to, uh, you know, help not only these tenants but other tenants in Capitola who may be facing this situation. Um, and I really think it's unconscionable that a property manager or a property owner would take such steps um, in view of the state legislation simply for the reason of trying to upscale and upmarket their property, but putting so many families. Uh, potentially at risk and out into the streets uh, during the holidays. Um, I just think it's a, an awful thing to do. Um, uh, and so uh, I just wanted to state that, uh, and with that, I vote yes. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Bertrand. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So, um, back to another issue. Um, we have Christmas tree lights and um, uh, item 7B, and I don't know that everyone's gonna wanna uh, save for this, but um, <laughs> it's important for the residents and the businesses of Capitola to have this right, so that's why it's on the agenda. Uh, staff report, please, Steve. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, yeah, we're here to talk about the village tree lights uh, as we head into the holiday season here. Some quick background, earlier this year, the city council held two hearings uh, regarding the LED rope lights that were provided by the business improvement area district uh, to decorate the palm trees prim primarily along Capitol Avenue, but also in front of the restaurants on the Esplanade and also and on San Jose Avenue. In May, uh, the council directed staff to leave the existing rope lights in place uh, for the city to buy and install some alternative colored rope lights, which was done, and for the BIA to develop uh, plans to replace the rope lights by the end of October, which was last week. An ad, ad hoc palm tree lighting committee was formed and has been working on this issue for several months. Uh, in September, they began working with the Christmas Light Pros, which is a company from over the hill that does exactly that, Christmas light decorating. Um, they had lots of ideas, and they recommended that uh, low voltage LED lights replace the existing rope lights. So um, some LED test lights were installed uh, in early October 
at the uh, intersection of Cap Ave and San Jose. So this is just a picture. These are the LED low voltage lights that were installed by uh, Christmas light pros. These are the rope lights in the background here. Um, I'm gonna come back to this picture in a minute uh, to explain part of what we're going to consider tonight. So um, the lighting subcommittee met this past Monday to discuss the low voltage uh, LEDs and seemed to support them. Uh, and then a couple of days or you know, yesterday, they provided a uh, proposal to the city. Um, there's a lot to the proposal, but the highlights of the plan include uh, removing the existing bright white LED rope lights and replacing them with low voltage LEDs. Um, procure the low voltage LEDs from Christmas light pros complete the switch over in January or February of 2020 of next year. They estimate the cost to be between $10,000 and $17,000. And the reason for such a large variation is, is kind of dependent on whether public works crews install the, uh, uh, the new lights or if the Christmas Light Pro company comes in and do it. It's about $200 a tree to have them installed by the company. Um, it was clear that I think they probably do a better job than public works, so that's why they're trying to do that. So the lighting subcommittee is going to seek partners uh, in funding. They're gonna to talk to several other groups around the village and see if they can raise enough funding to A, buy the lights and B, have the uh, Christmas light pros and install them. So I wanna go back to this picture real quick. The lights you see here are wrapped um, with a spacing between each row between two and three inches. That gives us, and that's 100 feet of light there, which gives you approximately five feet of lighted area, five to six feet. It all depends on the circumference of the tree, obviously, uh, the height of the tree. And so what the um, Christmas Light Pro person call uh, recommends is they actually go out and, and try and measure the circumference of each tree, figuring out a good spacing that would probably get a higher or more complete coverage of the tree. He recommended going from two to three to four to six inches in the spacing, which would effectively double the length of lit area on the tree. But they're gonna go through and um, I think their goal is to establish um, a, a width of the tree or height of the tree that will be lighted and will be uniform down the street. So every tree will be lighted up to 20 feet as long as it's a 20 foot tree and will stop at five feet. And then they can vary the actual length of each light strand of lights for each tree. So they're gonna work on that um, after the holidays and then come back with a, uh, they'll refine the costs at that point and come back. So, you know, tonight we were, the agenda report talks about uh, we were supposed to remove the lights at the end of October. Obviously we passed that date and we wanted to give the council uh, a chance to consider uh, extending that through the holidays. So with the um, proposal that the ad hoc committee has pr presented, your options tonight are to extend the existing rope lights to February. That gives the committee a chance to finalize their proposal and see what kind of fundraising they're able to do. If we do leave the lights in place through February, um, they've requested and I recommended this to them, that we remove the test lights that are, there's three lights, trees with different colored lights on them out there right now. Um, I think it'd be best if to have some uniformity through the village and through the season. And so remove all the warm white lights and um, put up strands of uh, the white bright lights. It's actually only one, Two trees have both lights on them right now and the one tree will require us to actually hang new lights, but that's not a, a big deal. And then um, as part of this would be to direct staff to continue working with the lighting subcommittee and the BIA to develop the transition pan from the low voltage LEDs and then we would return to council. So that's one option. The other option, um, frankly, is to direct me to um, have the re lights removed at this time. And that's my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of Steve? Sam? Yeah, and, well, and this may be more for the city <laughs> attorney, just as a point of order. Um, on the agenda, the agendized item is whether to remove the lights or to give grant a continuance. And then 
we've now received this detailed proposal. Um, is it appropriate for us to comment on the proposal or um, make, I mean, the, it says that one of the options is to accept the ad hoc committee recommendations. Um, I'll take a stab at this. So I think what staff is asking for is either an extension as requested by the ad hoc subcommittee with some of these other provisos um, that are identified here or to take them down at this time. Staff's understanding is that if there is ultimately an application to do something different, that the, the BIA or subcomponent of the BIA would work with staff pursuant to the third bullet there and develop something for council approval. So you'd not be approving a new light strategy tonight. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I don't have any questions, but I have comments when, when we okay. come back. Um, at this time, uh, people in the audience would like to speak on this and um, likely suspects. how I feel. Um, <laughs> Karin Hanna, likely suspect. Um, so I just wanted to, I, I, I'm really, really glad that you asked that question because first of all, we didn't get very much notice that this was going to be on the agenda. And then to see in the staff report that accept the recommendations from the committee was kind of a shocker. Um, because this committee is not a committee of the BIA. And it, that needs to be made really clear. This is a committee that Gary Wetzel and Ed Bodorf came up with all by themselves, two people who are very much against the current lights. They selected the people who were going to be on this committee. They held it in a location where they did not allow the public to attend, did not allow the public to attend. Anybody who said, I, I'd like to come and just sit in on the meeting, they weren't allowed. So this has not been a transparent, um, uh, process and so we saw I believe it was yesterday that the additional materials came out that's the first time anybody on the BIA has seen this recommendation so um, it was always our understanding that when this co this committee came up with their recommendation that the, there would be then a period to discuss it where the BIA could pull their members, discuss it with the board, vote on the recommendations of this outside committee and that the, that the city council would take the recommendation of the BIA and this committee both into consideration. And this is not, didn't feel like what's happening um, tonight. So um, hopefully there'll just be at this point an extension and then the committee, I mean the committee's report just, it, it has a lot, of, it still has a lot of gaps. And I think they kind of felt like they had to get something together for this meeting in order for you to, to make a decision whether you were going to um, extend this, this period uh, going forward. Um, so hopefully the, there'll just be an extension of this time and that the BIA will have an opportunity to look at the report for more than two days. Thank you. So you need time, basically. Well, yes, we have yeah. to call our board together. We have to poll our membership. You know, it's a busy season right now. We all work full time. It's, you know, we can't just stop, drop everything and go out and start polling people. Plus. I, Honestly, I don't think we have a complete, I don't think you have a complete report. I, certainly from what I saw, it's not, it's not complete. Um, a lot of discussion still needs to go on about what it's ultimately gonna look like. I mean, if, if you really think that that little section, which is what they're recommending, five feet off the ground up to 20 feet, is what we're hoping for, maybe, I don't know. I think you ought to look at it again, thank you. So I was working with the committee as well as the BIA on some of this stuff and we are seeking a continuance because putting the report together was rushed because we didn't know we actually had a city council meeting within two days. 
um, and agree to everybody on the committee agreed from the residents and a few merchants that are on there that we're not ready. There's a lot of spacing issues, some of the lighting, the contracting, if it's going with the city. We also need to, you know, bid it out. We can't just go with one bid. We actually have to put out three bids to see the right pricing, this, the right contractor. It's not ready for the holidays. And uh, all the merchants and the residents agreed that we should keep the lights up, lights for the holidays. And then when we find the right solution, then we can, you know, present something to the BIA and present something to city council. But at this time, I don't think there's any lighting that we have right now that would work and appease everybody. Because if we were to rush something, we're gonna be back here in a year from now with the same issues that we did the first time. You know, there's a lot of steps that need to take involved and we're just not there. So we'd like to get a continuance into January to re, you know, resurface this and kind of see where we're at. And to be honest, I would say we're looking at more like March, April for an actual full out proposal of time to put something up by spring. But even in January, February, the committee will meet again. Doesn't mean they're gonna have the right solution. There's still a couple more trials that we have to do with those lights that are up there. I just have a question. Um, so you're really not sure of the timeline? I mean, we can tell you January, February, because that's a, you know gonna get us to that point. Yeah, but okay. there's still some more trials that we have to do, which right. we can't do during the holiday season without having the lights look differently. Right. So from what you saw, we need to still decide, are we gonna start the lights at the bottom of the tree and go all the way up? Yeah. Do we start five feet up or three feet up to present from bikes and, and uh, people breaking the lights? Right, right, yeah. What's the space? Are we doing three to four inches? Are we doing six to eight inches? If we do six to eight inches, now the length of the rope lights is now longer to go all the way up the tree, and that costs more money. So that we still have to reevaluate what the total cost would be. We're estimating between 10 and 17,000 based on three to four inches and 100 feet of light per tree. Mm -hmm. But if we do this, increase the spacing of the lights and go farther down and up the tree, then you might look at 200 feet or 150 feet, mm -hmm. which then that changes all the numbers. Got it. So as of now, I mean, this is a, a plan and a progress, but this isn't a definite proposal. It's more of here's what we're working on. We've consulted an outside contractor. We have some trials in place, but this is just showing you that we have a plan and a progress, but we don't have a definite answer to this right now. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, please come forward. My name is Jamie McVicker. Good to be back here in Capitola for my fourth winter. Um, I come from kind of a different perspective, maybe the only one in the room, but I come from the perspective as a resident, but as a resident that actually lives right in the village with these lights. I live at 208 uh, Monterey Avenue above the store. <coughs> um, as I understand it, there's been some debate about the brightness of the lights and about the aesthetics. Um, but where I come at it is from safety and security, and, and I would urge the council to, to, to let this trump almost all other considerations. Uh, Wall Street Journal reported this week that the number of, of pedestrian fatalities up, is up 53%. It's very dramatic. Uh, bicycle, uh, bicycles hit by cars are, op are up over 30%. Living there, every morning between 6.30 and 7, I walk down Monterey Avenue over Capitola to get my newspaper. There's already cars streaming by, and it's dark. It's already dark out there at 5.30. When I'm out in the morning, I'm not alone. There's single women that are out jogging on the streets. There's some people that are already out there with their dogs. This isn't like a quiet residential street. These are cars screaming up Capitola from both directions. So also not a quiet residential street in terms of what to expect. This morning I knocked on the window of a person sleeping in their car, homeless, who had left their cars on. I thought his battery might die. That person was there. Last year I called the police because somebody was beating up their girlfriend on the street that I could see clearly. The point I'm trying to make is that the lights that exist today are bright. We feel more safe. The residents that actually live there and being able to cross these streets. Um, aesthetically, that's subjective, but in terms of safety, I hope you'll put the, the I see nothing wrong with what you have now in making the residents that, that actually live there feeling more safe and secure and not getting hit by cars as we cross those streets in the dark. Any other comments from people in attendance? Thank you. Good evening. How are we doing tonight? Good, good, good. We're doing fine. Thank um, you. 
So also uh, as a resident down here and business owner and board member in the BIA, the Capitola Foundation and the Chamber of Commerce, um, I supported the original lights that we have up currently, um, but since there's so much issues with the way they look um, and uh, to take them down or change them, whatever it may be, uh, I would strongly encourage at least leaving them up until January or February so we can continue to um, evaluate the situation. But again, like this other gentleman said, I also agree, I live right on Stockton Avenue in Central Village. Uh, it's very dark and when, if the thought of taking these lights down, especially before the holiday season, I think is foolish uh, as well as it would take away from the charm. Again, as he said as well, some people don't like the color that's neither here nor now the main point is much safer and it is bright and it does add some festivity to the to the area um, at least let's leave them up for the time being and we can come to a uh, new uh, resolution in the in the near future but again le taking them down would be simply foolish in my opinion uh, for safety and for just the look of the town in general thank you thank you Okay, seeing no one else coming, bring it back to City Council for comments. Sam? Well, else? sure, yes. Um, well, it was, it was my sense, I thought the question before is, is whether to grant an extension or to uh, have them removed. Uh, I certainly uh, don't want to have them removed at this, this point because we're not prepared to put anything else up. Um, and for all the reasons that are stated, we need to have something uh, better than nothing. Um, uh, with that said, uh, I think that we can um, satisfy all those interests of safety uh, and aesthetics at the same time. Um, so uh, I would like to support granting an extension until February of 2020 to allow time for the committee and the BIA to do its work to get together and have a more uh, detailed um, um, plan. Um, and with a cost and a budget associated with it um, and to work with staff to develop that plan and bring it back to the council in February. So um, if I may, I'd like to make that motion. Oh, and maybe to add one other thing, just that, that rec comment or request to have them all be uniform, I think that makes sense um, just for consistency for the holidays. And so I would like to include that in the motion as well. With all that said, I'm one of those that don't care for the light, so, but I get it. Thank you. you have a comment? Uh, can I make a friendly, request a friendly amendment to the motion? Well, if somebody seconds it first, I believe, oh, and okay. then, I will second. otherwise you don't Oops. need to make a, second an amendment. Now. Okay. Can I second it and then ask for a friendly amendment? I think you can. Okay. okay. I will second it and ask for a, for a friendly amendment. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, the motion is to keep them up until February. I'm going to request an amendment to say uh, to keep them up through February at which time it will come back to the council so that we don't find ourselves in a similar situation where all of a sudden on February 1st we're going oh I guess we're gonna have to take them down now and instead to have them return to us in February to provide an update with an understanding that we're expecting the update to be here's what we're gonna do now is that um, um, well if it's implicit in there that, that uh, the proposal is gonna come to us then at least by March of 2020, no later than March of 2020. I, th I think uh, maybe maybe there's a, a, a better way for me to word what I'm trying to suggest. My suggestion is, is that I want to I want to um, suggest an amendment to the motion that says that come this deadline we will expect another presentation, not come this deadline we're turning everything off. Oh sure, understood. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so there's a motion and second. Uh, any other comments? I, I just want some clarification that the BIA feels confident in this March deadline, if this is realistic. I don't want to waste any more of anyone's time doing this back and forth. If you feel as a board, or maybe we can get some clarification on that from, on, let's talk about real, real timelines, real deadlines. If I heard April, I mean, so. Well, considering that's an ad hoc committee, mm -hmm. they have to present that to the BIA and the BIA board would have. So really it's not up to the BIA 
to bring it to you until the committee has actually finished the plan. And that's a committee of some merchants, but a lot of residents are on How the How often do you meet? Once a month, if that. Okay. And a lot of the residents that are on there are not always there. So we haven't actually had a meeting. I could say that everybody that was on the committee has been there. It's maybe four or five people, seven, three. So that's kind of the issue is as we get to the holidays and whatnot, a lot of the residents aren't making the meetings and neither are some of the merchants. So we haven't had like a cohesive meeting. Sure. So without that committee coming up with a plan to present to the BIA and to be able to present to you, I can't give you a hard deadline. And the BIA can't give you a hard deadline until the committee actually, this ad hoc committee actually finishes the proposal and has a hard number to present. Cute. And that might be something that needs to be discussed with Ed as he was kind of put the with Gary and they're kind of running this committee or at least Gary is? Well, I think that's besides the point. I think what we need to do here is just make sure that we don't go back and forth uh, like Chris, Ms. Uh, Vice Mayor Peterson was, was saying that when you come to us, it would be nice to just have it all finalized versus, you know, be, things being brought up over and over again. I ideally would love to see something in April or, you know, something. And it's a fair give, timeline. Yeah and have something that's tangible and then make a decision at that point. If I can comment also, sure. um, I, am, I am the council's representative to the BIA and also uh, on the lighting committee. Um, um, I acknowledge that I missed the last meeting due to work I wasn't able to attend. Um, however, I, I will would be glad to make it very clear to the lighting committee members that there is, um, that time is of the essence. Um, I, I will say that I, um, have expressed that throughout this process and we had some hiccups in the first couple months. Um, I'm confident that the uh, lights that we had on trial will not face, uh, cause us to say, face the same hiccups as we did in the first couple months of, of the committee, um, but I'm happy to express to the committee that um, in order to um, continue to move forward that the council is expecting them to bring a proposal to the BIA so that the BIA membership can approve it as well. Um, and if I may, just as a word of caution, I think it's going to be important for, for us as a body moving forward to reconsider things like ad hoc committees that don't have budgets or, or voting power or whatnot. Um, you know, a couple years back, we had the ad hoc committee on the bluff, and we had some great ideas and no money to do anything about it. Um, so I think that this is kind of a, another sign as we move forward that a lot of people want to do a lot of good things, but we need to ensure that we're not creating committees that don't have the capacity to do what we're asking them to do. Um, so, but but to your point, I would be happy to, um, you know, if it is the the general consensus of the of the council to bring it forward to the lighting committee that we're expecting them to bring their proposal to the BIA, um, and allow the BIA time to vote and that all of that needs to uh, be considered and brought back to us um, by the end of February for further consideration. Can I, I can't recall, did we request that the committee bring back the proposal or that the BIA bring it back to us? I don't believe that the city formed the ad hoc committee. I believe that that was done independent of the city. Okay. That's my recollection. Yeah, the, the minutes do not reflect the request for any okay. ad hoc committee. Great. That's what. I, so that, that's actually a BIA ad, ad hoc committee. No, no. No. It may be a volunteer committee. They formed on their own, is right. my understanding. Right. So I just want to make. I just want to be clear that it's the BIA that comes back as a body with the recommendation to council in May or whatever month you said. I can't remember what you. I year. think it would February. be February. February. I'd like to. Can I? Can we? Ex I would suggest we extend that to give them time to kind of get everything together and figure that out um, with plenty of time and that the BIA returns as a body with with what you all as a body would would like to do. Do you accept that amendment? I haven't heard it extended to when. Um, I, I don't think that they'll have enough time by February or March, to be honest. I mean, we had a few folks already mention that. And so. Well, I believe there was one vote that mentioned made that statement and I believed that he was speaking on behalf of the BIA so that that was that's from what I understand Did somebody from the BIA come speak to this question again about how much time the BIA needs to I would say 
from when we get the committee report, at least one one board meeting, one to two board meetings to go over it. One for them to re look through it and, and poll the membership, and then the second to vote on it. What date? But March, April. When's the, when do you expect to get the committee report? It sounds like there's the committee is not a formal committee. It has no particular timeline. It has no particular budget. It has no particular mandate. Um, and so that's what I'm concerned about. And I think the BIA should take control of this process um, and either adopt and accept these preliminary recommendations or revamp them and, and start that process so you can have some better controls over the time of this. So I guess to speaking to the question, and, and thank you for, for uh, bringing that to us. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to compromise to March, but I, I don't want to see this continually being, right. uh, you know, extended out into the future. Um, at that point, if the BIA feels that they need more time, they can come back to us then and ask for another extension. I'd rather do that um, than just have a lengthy deadline mm -hmm. on this topic. Can I have some clarity on the motion? I think what, <laughs> I think what might be helpful, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing March, and can we just say that by the first meeting in March that we are either bringing an item just to update the council on what's happened, that we either have or have not gotten a proposal from the BIA, and, and just say that that's, that first meeting in March is the date when we're going to be making a decision? Well, I mean, the original motion was by the end of February, and so the first meeting March it doesn't seem like it give us maybe we could say by the second meeting in March that That's gives fine. them some additional time uh, to develop work this out and then bring us something so we'll say the second by our second meeting in the in March 2020 yes that it will return to us not that that's a hard deadline to take flights down correct well uh, well the goal is that a proposal will return to us yes but if they're not ready yeah, you know, come back and ask for another <laughs> extension. But tell us why, so. Yeah, so um, I'll make a comment. So I think it's really important that the BIA, I totally agree with Yvette that BIA takes uh, charge of this process, but more importantly, it's important to have a transparent process that includes the businesses and the residences in the amount of time that you feel that you can get to a solution, you know, something that everyone feels comfortable with. Because after all, it does affect these two areas, the businesses and how they're gonna do well in the seasons, and also the residents that live there. And a little recount, the first time this came up, um, I do recall a lot of letters from residents and maybe other people who are just visiting here about safety. So, you know, I hope that's a component. Um, people do feel, um, that's a very big issue, especially when it's dark at night. And um, as Jamie mentioned, I, I don't know if he talked about this last year, but as Jamie just mentioned, that has come up multiple times and now it's coming up again. So I think that's really something we should focus on. So with that, um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, roll call vote again, please. Council Member Story? Yes. Council Member Peterson? Aye. Council Member Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Bertrand? Hi, so it passes, thank you very much. Thanks for everyone coming and the comments were great. It helped us understand the situation a lot better. Appreciate that. So with that, this meeting is adjourned, thank you.